Alright, welcome to part 2 of the Warden's Realism Analysis, where I'll be going over the armor, weapons, and a few comments on the other stuff like emotes and executions. If you haven't seen the first video I made about his stances and attacks, I recommend viewing it, even though I was a bit under the weather, so I apologize for that, and it is a very long video, so I apologize for that as well. I didn't actually expect it to be that long, but then I needed to make sure I was thorough, and there was so much recording that I needed to do as well to make sure that I was thorough, that I didn't really have a chance to make sure I was better. But I'm not sick now, so hopefully... The last video wasn't too unbearable, but speaking about the last video, there's a few notes I'd like to make on that before we start this one. There's a lot of information when it comes to fighting with a longsword that I did not cover, like going into the bind, edge alignment, hand placement on the sword, and a bunch of other stuff. And if I were to go into that, then it'd just be a video about how to fight with a longsword and not really just analyzing what the warden is specifically doing. And it would also make the video much longer than it already was. Now, like I stated in my last video, I am not an expert and I do not claim to be. I'm just a guy who likes swords and history with only Google and a lot of reading at his disposal. So please bear with me if I get something wrong and feel free to correct me if I didn't get something right. I'm always open to a respectful discussion about history because I always love learning more. Now with all that out of the way, let's start. So before we get into the sections though, we need to set the context for our upcoming research and information. Let's start with a very basic question of what is a knight? Or better yet, what would a knight look like? <laughs> uh, I, I, meant, I meant historically. Well, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to go into the history of knighthood and where the chivalric code comes from, and rather just talk about how we can correlate what we have in For Honor to examples we have in historical depictions. When it comes to medieval armor, there happens to be an amazing content creator known as Knight Errant who covers information such as medieval reenactment and historical accuracy. I highly recommend his channel if any of this stuff interests you. I'll leave a link in the description below that will show where this chart came from in the video that he made. Anyways, he created this chart that shows the changes through the centuries to the armor that a professional soldier, more specifically a knight, would be wearing at the time. Through the years, armor progressively got better and better, and although the wealthiest would be able to afford some of the armor that is available, like a plate harness that we see in the later centuries, I would say it's safe to assume that the warden is respectable and wealthy enough to purchase the armor to keep himself protected more so than the average man-at-arms. Or at least so you would think. As we proceed to try to pin down the setting that the armor of the warden originates from, it gets a lot more complicated than just saying it's from this era, it's either late medieval or it's high medieval, because it's very scattered about, and also, it's not fully complete. That being said, let's try to at least attempt to get a better understanding of the setting that the Warden would ideally be a part of. We'll start with his default armor, because that is clearly the depiction of the Warden that Ubisoft wants to show. It's presented in all the marketing material, and it's even the guy that gets the beating in all the execution previews. Now, if you watched my first video on the Warden, you would have heard me quickly mention that this helmet is the Visored Barbuda helm that is Italian in origin. Well, let me expand on that note real quick. The Barbut or Barbuda Helm is a 15th century helm that usually has a T or Y shape opening on its face and a center ridge that goes across the top. Though there is speculation on whether or not there is any evidence that would support the claim that the helm would be used with a visor, it is universally indisputable that the helm would be functional and satisfactory without one. Funny enough, Knight Errant has a video on the specific subject that refutes the idea that such a visor ever existed on this type of helmet to begin with. I'll link it in the description because i rather send people to places of more information than just me regurgitating said information and then claiming to be the one that knows about it. So forgive me if I tend to mention a lot of external sources, like I said earlier, I am not the expert here. Let's get back to the subject at hand though. The Visor Barbuda. I mentioned how it being Italian in origin might take away from the heavy German longsword fencing vibes the Warden is giving off. But from what I understand, the helmet did travel outside of Italy and make its way into other neighboring countries according to shipping logs. That being said, I think the origin story of the Warden's helmet is the least of his worries when it comes to the anachronism of his betrayal. But we'll get to that in a bit. This helm originates in the 15th century with most of its findings dated from mid to late 1400s, while also finding some evidence that shows this helm was prevalent around the turn of the 15th century as well. So for a helmet that existed for basically an entire century, why this one? Considering the era they had chosen, there are plenty of options when it comes to closed visored helmets that I find it strange that they would choose such a vague and possibly unhistorical type of helmet. Personally, with how famous and widespread the Hound Skull bassinet was, I'm actually offended that none of the knights used them. Not even the one that is declared by Ubisoft to be a practitioner of German longsword fencing. 
That's right. I have found it. I have found the truth to the question. Is the warden German or Italian? And the warden is German. Suck it, Fiore. All joking aside, of course, it's actually pretty interesting where I found this image specifically. I'll go more in detail about that later on, but for now, let's get back to the helmets. Besides bassinets, which would actually be facing out during the 15th century, there is also the option of the salad, which is another very fine helmet if I do say so myself. Personally, I think the warden would look really cool in full gothic armor, but I suppose that's just my opinion. Overall, I think that there's just better options of the Barbuda helm, and hopefully down the line, Yubi will make some more historical helms for people who enjoy this kind of stuff, like me. Now segueing from that, what helms does the warden have that I would say is the most historically accurate? Mind you, I say historically accurate, not what is the best armor because everyone should have their own tastes and what to wear. Even me. So remember, everything that I bring up is in the context of just historical discussion, not really like, you should wear this. That said, let's talk about the helmets the warden has that is considered somewhat historical. And let's start with the second runner-up, in my opinion. And the second runner-up to me is the Great Helm. I know, sadly, the Great Helm is the second runner-up, but it's because of one glaring issue, ventilation. It either has way too much or not enough. Now, when it comes to the Great Helm, the Warden has four of them. The Merope Helm, the Vengeful Instigator, the older style Great Helm, Elner, and then the coolest of them all, the Arcturus Helm. Since the Merope and the Vengeful Instigator are basically the same helmet, I'll be covering both at the same time. Everything about these helms is actually very good and practical for the most part, and this is what you'd be seeing on the smaller great helms. And by smaller, I mean the ones that would be the only form of protection, which was very short-lived considering that it wasn't a very practical helm on foot, even though it was very protective, it was very cumbersome and restrictive. So in later years, you would actually see that knights would wear a great helm, and then under that a servoyer, or also known as a skull cap, and then a male coif, and then padding. That way they could remove the Great Helm after the cavalry charge when their perception was more important than their protection because it would be on foot and a lot more close quarters. We see depictions of the Great Helm being used more on cavalry than on foot in the Morgan Bible. You can see in the example to the left. And we'll come back to the Morgan Bible in just a bit, but let's get back to the focus of the video and go over how this helm functions based off of the in-game model. We see in the Merope, the Vengeful Instigator, and the Elner that they all have ventilations called breaths in front of the helm. The problem with them is that they're absolutely massive. We can see here in this finding of the Castel St. Angelo helm, probably being the best historical example of the largest breaths I have ever seen on a great helm, and yet they're still small compared to the ones the Warden has. Now the biggest downsides to having large ventilation holes on a helmet is of course, you know, you could get a sword point or a dagger point through there, but a much bigger problem was that shrapnel from wood as in splintering lances or shields could get in there, or a random arrow. I know it's extremely unlikely, but the idea of having a helmet like this is to go for maximum protection, especially while on horseback, and these are small minute features that you're going to have to think about when constructing a helm like this. There are historical examples of much smaller ventilation than what is shown here, and I'm going to show that along with the next helm, the Arcturus helm. Now the Arcturus helm, although the sexier helm, is probably the least historical compared to the other ones because of the fact that it has no ventilation at all. No one would want to wear this thing, especially while moving and exerting themselves in combat. So in theory, if you're wearing this helm, the only ventilation you'd have is between your eye slits or the bottom of your helm where it opens up. If anyone has ever worn something like a ski mask or something like that while physically exerting themselves, they'll know how hard it is to breathe through just fabric. Now think let alone something that's in front of them that's blocking their inhalation entirely. It's a shame too because this could have been the most realistic helm of them all, and that could have been due to this example right here. Yeah, this resemblance is pretty uncanny. It's weird how the helmet photo is kind of just like the thumbnail in the game. It's, yeah, it's kind of unsettling actually. But if we take a look at this helmet, you'll see that the holes don't need to be that large either. This example of a great helm from mid 13th century Germany, you'll see that the helmet is dotted in very small holes. Just enough holes so that you aren't sacrificing that much of the structural integrity, but you're making the ventilation just a little bit better. So, Arcturus was the one that I would say is the closest to getting the first spot for most realistic and feasible helmet, but sadly its asphyxiation problem has put it to second. So, what does take first, you might ask? Well, in my opinion of the current armor sets that are in the game, I would have to go with the obscure Enigma helm. Interestingly enough, these helms that are the most accurate are not helms of later eras that the longsword fencing would be popular. 
Great Helms and these Helms, though, would be present during the Crusades, and if you didn't know already, the preferred weapon of Crusader would have been an arming sword and shield for the majority of the Crusades, as the longsword would not have been introduced until much later. And although the longsword did show up in the later era of the Crusaders, it was not very much of a battlefield weapon, more or less a sidearm, or something used for sport. And really, the use of swords in a battlefield context is a debatable subject in of itself because of the use of spears, pikes, axes, maces. It's not really the point of this video, though, so just in general, longsword didn't exist until late 13th century. Although Ubisoft themselves are kind of perpetuating the idea that the Warden is a crusader, and we'll get back to that idea more later on in the video. Back to the helmets. Now, this helmet took first because it's feasible, but it still has problems in of itself. But for the most part, it's more realistic than the others. From what it looks like, it appears to be some sort of nasal helm or servalier, but its attachment system for the male is all wrong. As we can see in game, it looks like it has a riveted liner around the brim of the helm itself, and then attached the male to the helm like it's an aventail. For this type of helm, especially if it's going for a nasal helm, then the male would actually just be a male coif, or a hood, and then the helm would go over it. Also, even though this would be more of a nasal helm than a servalier because of the center ridge that goes over the head, and the nose protection it has, it is also much too round to be a nasal helm. Although there are always exceptions, and as we can see here again in the Morgan Bible, there are multiple different kinds of helmets in this specific scene, including a rounded nasal helm. Now as for face protection, you might be wondering if it's possible for a male to entirely cover the face like the obscure Enigma does. It very much could, and we have examples in artwork that show a male going and covering the mouth and sometimes even the tip of the nose. For a nasal helm and a servoyer, it is a little bit uncommon for the male to come up this high on the face, but as we see in later artwork depictions, there's going to be different types of male hoods or coifs or even aventails that attach to bassinets or sallets in a way that would cover almost the entire nose and everything else. As much as I want to rant on about how the discussion of difference between aventails and event tail and that how one of the examples back there had a male bever compared to just a normal plate bever along with the sallet, these are all terminologies that aren't important to the current discussion, so I'm just going to move on from here. Now, even though this helmet that is in-game is not entirely representative of a historical model, it's not implausible, and it does have a lot more practical merit to it. I mean, at least you can breathe out of this one. Overall, I think this is the most historical out of all of them, although technically wouldn't be the most protective. Sometimes you have to sacrifice protection for practicality. But beyond that, I don't think there's any more to break down on this one because I don't want to be too nitpicky. So let's move on to his next piece of armor, his arms. All right, for the arms, I'm just going to be brutally honest and say that the arm armor and pretty much the rest of the gear after this sucks. All right, sucks is a subjective term. By sucks, what I really mean is that it's just kind of a random jumble of gear that could date from multiple eras at once, and it has a lot of random and accurate things about it. For the arms, let's start with the default Warden armor again. Starting off, the biggest offender of the Warden's armor is its general lack of full coverage. This problem goes past the arms, but I'll point it out when I get there. What do I mean by this? Well, if we look at the Warden's right arm, we can see a male shirt. It looks like a male shirt, but it doesn't connect to his torso. Regardless, it then stops about three-fourths the way down his bicep, and then proceeds to just be Gambeson all the way down. Now don't get me wrong, Gambeson is a strong, effective, and necessary piece of armor, but its strengths pretty much stop at piercing attacks, and if there was a nice clean slash across it with a very sharp sword, the Warden would not be in a nice place. Okay, okay, maybe the Warden can't afford enough mail to cover his entire body, although then at that point he should put the mail on the exposures of his body, like the bend of his elbow and not under his plating, but anyways... We've seen that there are soldiers, and even knights, who weren't filthy rich, and though it is not the norm of a knight, especially one of his standing, it's not unreasonable to think that he just doesn't have the funds to fully protect himself. Okay, I guess that makes some sense. Well then, wait a second. Are those fully articulated 15th century full finger gauntlets with forearm protection? It's like this guy has no protection in one area, and then a fully tailored cutting edge piece of armor in the other. I like to imagine that he's taking all of his money and then just blowing it in a couple pieces of armor and then just leaving the others basically empty. I mean, I doubt it, but I like to believe. Now, lack of coverage is not just the only thing that you'll be seeing throughout the entire armor. There's another thing that I just want to get out of the way. 
because it's just infuriating how cliche this is and how wrong this is. Why is his entire armor covered in rust? Funny enough, it's actually a part of all materials, no matter which one you choose. I know that because I accidentally forgot to switch over back to iron when making a full default warden, so this is actually silver. You can really see on the elbow pads and the gauntlets how bad the rust actually gets. Here's what all the materials look like on the armor, and you can see that they all rust. Now if you don't know, both silver and gold are non-corrosive, so it technically means it shouldn't be able to rust. One quick Google search would show that, and I know this is kind of a nitpicky thing, but it's really not about the different materials that could rust, it's just why add that much rust in the first place? I know they're trying to go for a gruff, battle-worn kind of feel to it, but like, if you were this guy who was fighting on a battlefield and you knew that rust is corrosive and damages the metal, why would you put that on something that you're trying to use to protect your life with? Funny enough, his armors all have types of rust on there, but a majority of his swords don't look like they have any rust on them at all. The swords are another story. As for your armor, take care of your armor, it'll take care of you. Enough said about the rust. Two more things I'd like to touch on before we move on from this. Uh, he doesn't have matching elbow pads for some reason. It's like he lost one and just replaced it with some random one. And then he also has ridiculously large pauldrons, and there's way too large of a gap between each of the plates. They should be much more fitted to his arm. When thinking of large pauldrons, I like to think of tournament armor. This is the tournament armor of Henry VIII, or one of his many suits of armor. As you can see here on his pauldrons, or just anywhere that has multiple layers of plates stacked on top of each other, they're very closely fitted together. And that's usually because you wouldn't want any sort of dirt, grime, or even stuff that's large, maybe a dagger or something like that. You don't want that slipping through the gaps of your plate. So you want to make sure everything is closely fit together. Although I can kind of understand that Yubi just probably wanted another thing to use their physics engine on. All right, enough of dragging on the warden's armor. We'll do more of that later. What do I say is the most realistic? Well, again, we really don't have that many options considering they're basically all the same pieces of armor, which mostly includes the base game set until they added a new variant with their last set of armor. From that variant, there's one specific piece that isn't that bad, and that piece is the Tranquil Wayfarer. Specifically, and only, the Tranquil Wayfarer. And mind you, I did not say historically accurate, it's just that this one has the most realism to it, to where it's like, yeah, that could protect you. Why this one? Full male sleeves. That's basically it. Male was a staple of medieval combat for centuries, and for good reason. I mean, actually, male was even used during Roman times with their Lorica Hamata. Not having male means you have plate, and not having either means you're either really poor or you want to die. There are depictions of people who didn't have anything much of male, but they usually had a gambeson of some sort, and you have to understand that they were really poor. As you can see in this manuscript, there's multiple different types of people who are armored with different things. Some people don't even have male coifs, while some people do, and if you can see in the bottom left corner, there's even one guy who has a set of greaves. But if you are a professional soldier and you're constantly putting your life on the line, you'd probably want to put some money towards getting a good set of armor, more specifically a male hauberk. Back to the armor. So even though this armor is the most realistic, it's still very lackluster. There's no hand protection, and at least when it comes to longsword fencing for me, I get sniped in the hands quite a bit, but that's also because I'm an idiot and I kind of protrude my hands out a bit too much. But even so, if they see it as a target and you get hit there, you're losing one of your major things that holds onto your sword, so it's probably a good thing if you to wear something. Man, only if there was some sort of metal gloves that could protect his hands. Now if they really wanted to double down on that crusader style that they were putting off with those helmets earlier, then they'd ditch the plate and just put mail. Also they'd use mail mittens for hand protection. Honestly, a more tapered and form-fitting warden look with no plate and just mail would probably be more intimidating than a guy who just looks like he clanks with every step he takes, but that's just my opinion. As for the in-game armor, the plate that comes with it doesn't look too historically accurate either, or really well fitted for that matter. The shoulder pieces are so massive that it looks like they're actually levitating off the body. You know, the more that I think about it, the more I start to realize that the massive shoulders are to perpetuate the idea of the warden being the human shoulder, and that makes me sad. But yeah, Tranquil Wayfarer. Uh, the other ones are alright, but they just kind of add more to the bulk with like spikes or studs or something like that. Alright, it's time to go to chest pieces. Again, we'll start with the default chest piece. Now, even though it says chest piece, it's everything from the torso down, so we'll analyze all of that. Starting with the torso itself, interestingly, it has one set of armor, which is the coat of plates. 
that would be very cool and could tie in with the armor that they're already trying to portray with the rest of the time period, whatever that's supposed to be, but it just looks sad. The armor has six, count it, six plates on the chest. There are absolutely massive gaps between each plate and I just wonder why? Why even wear it? Six plates will barely stop anything, especially punchers, which is one of the most common and lethal things on a battlefield next to bludgeoning. It's very disappointing. But especially when it comes to punctures, if one of those punctures were to hit the plate and then glance upwards, downwards, to the left or right, it would find itself in one of the gaps and it would just go right through into one of the non-protected parts. And because you don't have any chainmail, it's basically going to get you killed. Everything looks worn per usual, and we can see the chainmail coif sit upon his collarbone. No other mail in sight for his chest. If we look at the back side of the chest piece, we can see that his belt has little metal circles around it though. Those little metal pieces are called mounts, and they're very popular for people who wanted to adorn their belts and show that they could afford to buy a nice articulated piece of metal attached to their leather belt. My question is, why is he missing one on almost all of his belts? I get that he's supposed to look battle-worn, but I mean, does every piece of armor need to look battle-worn? We can't have one where he has a nice belt, nice armor, and he's taking care of all of it. Speaking of things around his back though, when I first started playing this game, I thought the thing on his back was supposed to be a tabard, or tabard, or however you're supposed to pronounce it. It's apparently a cape. Why? I don't know. Is it historical? I don't think so, at least not in this case. When it comes to things that people wore in the medieval times, it's usually something that has a bit of a practical use to it. People did wear capes, and they wore cloaks, but they usually covered a majority of their body. And it would make sense for him to wear a cloak while he's in full suit of armor because that will protect his armor from the elements. But it doesn't really cover much and it being tucked in makes it harder to, you know, take off. And you'd most likely take off a cape or a cloak if you're about to go into combat because it would really just get in the way. The belt system they have was actually very popular for keeping tunics, surcoats, and loose clothing items close together. So that is one thing that I can commend them for, is they did a pretty good job on that. But I can't find a reason of why you would want to get a cape just to tuck it into your belt. Also, why is the cape so small? What What's its purpose for? If it's not to keep them warm or dry and it can't wrap around the body like a cloak could, why is it there? All I can think of is that they kind of wanted to make a surcoat, but it doesn't cover the front of his body, and all it does is just hang out in the back and really not do anything, so it's just weird. Although one thing that I have to say that I think is really neat is the stitching on the cloth of the cape is in a cross patch kind of pattern that you would usually see on very thickly woven linen. This allows it to infer that it's either linen, canvas, burlap, something of that nature. And I mean... It's most likely linen, seeing that it's a very common textile throughout the medieval era. But if they wanted a more historical cape slash cloak, they should have made it something like a wrap around the body, and they should have done something that's a much thicker fabric, like wool, or something that can repel rainwater, dirt, mud, and keep the armor uh, dry and clean. Moving on down the armor, we got some sort of hanging chainmail loin protection thing. It maybe could have been believable if it was like a chainmail skirt to try and extend the length around the hauberk, but no. It's just a sheet that hangs there. Okay. It's funny because if we look at some examples of hauberks, we can see that sometimes they are made with the exact opposite in mind and put a split there to make it easier for riding on horseback and for maneuverability just in general. The little standard things that hang on each side of the loin mail are dagged, which is a nice touch for later period clothing, but again, what era is this warden trying to portray? So, Per leg armor, it looks like he's got shin guards, and that's it. Not even any sabatons or anything to protect his feet. The fact that he has no thigh protection or foot protection, he can literally go down with one arrow shot from a relatively low powered bow to the leg. I mean, even if you put aside a bow, there are major arteries in each thigh. A simple sword, spear, anything that's most common on a battlefield will probably do the trick. Again, it's kind of crazy to think about the armors that they could have for Warden, and then to think about what they actually gave him. It really puts into perspective how little he's actually wearing in terms of protection. Now for the armor that I would choose to be more realistic. Again, it's not easy considering the few options, but I'd choose one of the newer ones again. This time it's Chilled Tomb. It comes with a full chainmail shirt, it comes with a full tabard, which is really an ahistorical surcoat, but better than the cape thing. 
And even though it may not be much, there's also leg protection. And that last reason is why I chose Chilled Tomb specifically, because of the fact that not just does it have padded choses or hosen or whatever, pants, they're studded as well. Obviously, it's not as effective as wearing chainmail, but it's better than just wearing the plain pants that he had on before. Even the shin guards got an upgrade. They now cover more surface area on the front, and they wrap around the back now, projecting a majority of the calf. The front cuirass chest plate things are interesting. Again, they're probably just something that they could show off the physics with. So again, better, but not really historically accurate. <sighs> 26 minutes in and I'm just now getting to swords. All right, let's get started with the swords. To start, it's finally a default that isn't the worst option. Well, I mean, the helmet wasn't the worst, but still. Anyways, we'll start with the default Rogan blade. Okay, before I get into this specific blade, let's go over some of the problems that all the swords have. The best way to accurately describe these swords is that they are all ludicrously dummy thick. Like almost every single one of the swords are absolutely ridiculous when it comes to the thickness of the blade. A relatively thick blade, and I mean thick, would be about seven millimeters at the base, but would taper towards the point so it isn't that thick all the way along. Some of these swords are like an inch in thickness, and don't even get me started on Altair's Devotion. Holy Jesus! What is that? What is that? Some of these swords don't even have distal taper, and to make matters worse, I'd say that the thinnest these swords get are about 4 millimeters. None of these swords look like they have any flex to them, and that is incredibly detrimental for a weapon of this length. Rigid metal is usually brittle metal, that's why most medieval European swords flex, and katanas have a soft spine. Now as for the Rogan blade itself, it isn't in bad shape other than the fact that it's thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. The very long center fuller is reminiscent of an Oakshot Type 11. That type of blade is very prominent during the 11th and 12th century, not a type of fuller that you would usually see on a long sword, but I wouldn't call it ahistorical. Now if you hear me say the word Oakshot, that's because I'm referring to Oakshot's typology, which is created by Ewart Oakshot, who made a lot of information about a lot of types of swords and to dramatically understate the work that he's done. I would say that a lot of the modern information we have comes from him, so that's just a very short story, but if you get into swords, you're going to hear his name a lot. Now for a lot of the sword blades that the Warden has, it doesn't really taper to a sharp point, but to be fair, it's not like the Warden was going to use it in the first place. But again, nothing that would be ahistorical. So some good news for the Warden for once, I could say I could recommend this type of blade for its realism, not saying that it's spot on or that it's the only one, just that it's plausible. And you know what? That's good enough for me. Now, there are other blades, more contenders than any other category, so I'm just going to have to rapid fire them off with a little side note so I can get through all of them as fast as I can. Richter blade, reminiscent of a Type 13A blade with a gold brass motif in the center. The gold brass plating is possible and so is this blade. Gardakin blade, literally the Rogan blade but with a rounded tip. Don't know why it exists, but technically it gets to be here. Sheedon blade, reminiscent of a Type 20A but with very elongated fullers. Entirely plausible. Excluding the strange Rakasa motif, which in of itself is not unrealistic, the almost lenticular cross section, if not for the subtle midrib, actually shows that it's a diamond cross section with no fullers. Very nice. Gilen blade, another type of double fuller blade. This one is pattern welded or Damascus printed. Considering the fact that pattern welding was even a part of Viking era blades to increase structural integrity, I would not be surprised if this existed, although metallurgy should have advanced enough by now to not warrant this. Wisdom and judgment blade, hexagonical design with a wavy brass motif instead of a fuller. Fancy and I suppose plausible. Altair's devotion blade, and I know I said it was ridiculous, but that was just for the in-game thickness. I saw the guys at Ami make this blade, and that's why I'm saying maybe. But it's a very weak maybe, and that's why it's at the bottom. Alright, now that that's done, we can move on to guards. But before we again, thickness. Why is it so thick? Do they realize that metal was a commodity back then? I mean, I feel like they do because they did an amazing job on the Japanese weapons, specifically the katanas and nodachis. But yeah, way too thick. The cross guard is meant to provide protection to the hand, so of course they need to be strong, but it's just a bit excessive on these guards. But just like the sword blades, if we were to imagine they're a bit thinner, then the Rogan guard would not be that bad. Kind of reminiscent of an Oakshot style six guard, I could see this being real. Other candidates would also be Alistair guard. Literally the Rogan guard with more of a incandescent feel to it, I suppose. Serious guard. 
This guard is plausible, especially for later centuries and towards the end of the longsword's life cycle, but Jesus almighty Christ, what are those quillons? The tips of this cross guard look like they add a pound each. Very excessive. Gardaken guard, a uh, style that's comparable to nine or six and also with engravings. The sheeting guard, a nice swept S-shaped guard, which is very mild compared to some reproductions that I've seen. <clears throat> Moving on, we have the Tringad guard, along the same idea of design behind the Sirius guard, but this time we have the intent of being usable without a crane. Alright, we're almost done, just gotta do the rest of the hilt. For the default hilt, again, I'm sorry for sounding like a brokered record, but for the sake of clarification, I need to. Way too thick. The grip looks round like a log. You want the grip to be more oval shaped so you can find the edge of the blade so that you can do proper alignment with the strike you were thinking about. But if it's completely around, the only thing you'll have to find your edge with is the natural balance of the sword towards the edge. But seeing how these blades are shaped, I suppose it doesn't matter how you hold these baseball bats. All joking aside, the grip and the pommel aren't that bad. The leather wrap looks a little bit sloppy, but I wouldn't say that it's improbable. The pommel is a very interesting choice. It's a very ovalish pommel that is reminiscent of an oak shot type B pommel, and what I would say reminds me of a Norman sword pommel. You probably wouldn't find something like this on a long sword, but at the same time, it's not as crazy as some of the other hilts, so I'll let it slide. The hilt I recommend the most is actually two, but they're almost identical. It's the Sheedon and the Gardaken hilt. Both have an oak shot type T or T2 pommel. The leather wrap is just as sloppy as the Rogan's, but that's all because it's the same texture. Thanks, Yugi. The brass fittings on the Sheedon is not unrealistic, as a sword is just as much of a status symbol as it is a defensive tool. The reason I chose these hilts out of all the others is because of the pommel. The pommel tapers off to the grip, towards the top, and it creates a grip space without sacrificing weight, and you can see these tapered pommels in a few surviving examples of long swords, particularly the later period ones. That being said, there are some other notable mentions. Richter Hilt. Sad and crude, but not impossible for someone extremely poor. The pommel resembles an Oakshot Type B1 pommel with wood scales riveted to the tang for a grip, not even a leather wrap for grip protection. Again, crude, but not entirely unreasonable. Next is a serious hilt. This knob isn't as massive as the ones that were on the Quillens, but to be fair, it's all about context. It's a pommel. It's supposed to be a big knob. The only other problem I have is that the hilt has random exposed rivets all around the grip. That has to be uncomfortable, and there's no way that those rivets were necessary. The Gadwin Hilt. A nice leather wrap grip and an oak shot type T3 pommel to it, it would have taken the place recommended if it wasn't for a slightly oversized pommel, but honestly, it's still really good. Next, the Galford Hilt. Hey, remember the Richter Hilt? This is him now. Feel old yet? Alright, I'll stop dicking around. The Howard Hilt. I don't know how I feel about this one. For one, this is absolutely ridiculously ornate. You would have to be the highest in nobility to even consider this a thing. But let's take all the gold and the gems away. We have a round pommel with extra space on the grip to compensate that. We have a fine leather wrap with wire to go around the grip, which isn't really a longsword thing, and it's a bit wide between the wrappings, but I think the attention to detail is just too good not to mention. If there were a non-jeweled version of this with just a plain leather wrap and a wheel pommel made of steel, it would be first choice hands down. Gilen Hilt. The flower-shaped pommel, although not considered historical, I am putting here because it is feasible. We have seen flower-shaped pommels in artwork, and I don't think this one is that far beyond that. Also a much nicer wood grip with a floral motif engraved in it, and overall solid hilt. Altair's Devotion Hilt. A better looking leather wrap than the Rogan and a swept pommel along with it. The pommel is reminiscent of a Messer pommel and could theoretically have been a longsword, or at least a longsword shaped Messer. And that wraps up all the gear. Time to move on to some extras. Let's start with the executions. Hilt Strike. A guy who falls on his knees is probably already dead, but it's always fun to see a Hilt Strike even if it is unnecessary. And for those who don't know, this is in theory called a Mordhau. Backhand Strike. I find this execution interesting because if we put this in the context of a close quarter situation and let's say the sword blade got stuck in the enemy's armor, or you just got close enough to where holding your sword at a reasonable length is not viable, this shows an interesting technique that could be viable. Shoulder Tackle. Did you watch the first video? Do you remember me talking about how you don't actually want to perform a shoulder tackle? This is why, but with a bit more getting yourself accidentally impaled on their sword instead. Brutality of Cam Lam. 
This is a really quick and interesting example of three different types of half sorting. It shows a draw cut from half sword, a thrust from half sword, and then a hilt strike from half sword. It then finishes off with the Mordhau just to make it even cooler. A very interesting execution. Now let me just quickly gloss over some emotes that I find interesting since there's only a few. Recognition. It goes without saying, but kneeling in front of a sword is very common for people to associate with knights wanting to show their humbleness. It's also very commonly shown in regards to the Knights Templar, more specifically to the straight T-shaped crossguard resembling the crucifix and their faith to Christianity. Now if you already knew that, did you know that it was a custom for a crusader or the Knights Templar to pray up to seven times a day? If you knew that as well, then I have nothing more to share since you already know everything. Blade Homage The way I learned to salute with the sword is with the blade pointing up. Although I do like this version because of the whole when the blade is pointing down it looks like a crucifix thing, and what is more knightly than fighting in the name of God? Twirl. The figure eight is the easiest freaking flourish of them all, and it's not representative of the medieval sword master he's supposed to be. If you want to see a more impressive sword flourish, go look at Orochi's twirl a whirl emo, or katana spin signature. I swear man, the samurai get all the cool stuff. Sword point. Oh wow, look, he knows how to thrust with his sword. Now if we could just get him to do that in the general vicinity of his enemies, then we'll be onto something. Both knuckle crack and blade polish. Do not take a sword and stick it in the ground or put the point in the ground and twirl it. All you're doing is dulling a very good point and a bit of the edge. And then you're going to have to go and hone it later if you want it to be better again. In real life for a knight, a sword is the last line of defense if all things go to shit and you're about to place your life in the faith that your training and your sword will hold up. I don't know about you, but I want every little advantage I can get, so that includes the little extra bit of sharpness I can maintain at the tip of the blade. Now before I end this video, I just want to touch on one more subject, which is the ornaments. The fact that there aren't enough helmet plumes, and I'm not talking the Roman kind, is just as bad as not having a bunch of cool bassinets. I don't know how they missed a chance for cool ponytail plumes on the helms, but it is what it is. For some ornament ideas that go along with history, there's the great helm with torse, or a mantle, or the headband that goes with a cloth. There's many names that it goes by. I've heard it been called a torse, I've heard it been called a mantle. I've even heard it just been called the headband, but uh, overall that along with any of the helmets, even though it's supposed to go with the great helm, I think it would look great with all the other ones. Just at least give us the option to have it, it would be nice. In this late 14th century uh, depiction of Germany, you can see in the left center area there's a guy who has a plume, four feathers on top of the helmet. Feathers are very common for the plume construction and that would be really cool just to have the feathery plume. In this next one, we have a depiction of David and Goliath, although it just looks like a very short version of Fiora de Libri versus a knight who has the largest roll of newspaper I've ever seen. But if we look at the knight, he has two feathers, common standard plume, you know. I think that would be really nice to have as an ornament as well. A 15th century manuscript from France, another depiction of a plume, this time it's only two feathers, green and um, yellow. This would really show a cool option for like team colors, you know. If it's multiple colors in one palette, then they can use multiple colors for each feather in the plume. I think that's a great idea. Also, I just really like this photo because I don't know what artist who made this back in the 15th century, but why did they give him such a dumbass grin? Like he looks so content with what he just did. I don't, <laughs> I don't get it, but I love it. Also forgot to add uh, where I got the German longsword thing from at the beginning. It's this little PDF guide that's on the Ubisoft webpage about how to cosplay as like each of the characters. It's so weird. I love it. Check it out. I'll leave a link. It's amazing. <laughs> so that is going to be the end of this video. I'm glad it is finally done because it took forever to make and I've also been putting it off for quite a bit of time as well. But I'm proud of what it's come out to be and I hope you liked it as well. If you watched the entire thing then you're crazy and I appreciate it a lot. I know it was quite long and so I know it wasn't easy. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, prophecies, conundrums, let me know in the comment section. I will try my hardest to reply, but it took multiple months just to finish this video, so forgive me if I give you a late response. And with that, this video ends. One final thank you for watching this, and I hope you have a great day. Peace.